Well, I think the, the original idea was probably brewing in my father's mind for years. But um, beginning of the war, he, got, um, he joined the RAF as a um, chaplain and went to work in a vast training centre at Blackpool. And he was a bit appalled that the men had to do compulsory uh, church parade and things like that. So he started something that was called an answer back meeting, where the men could come and the officers were not allowed in uniform in case they put the men off to ask questions about anything they liked. And then these men went, and men and women went all over the world to wherever they were sent. But after a few months, they wanted to, to have an emblem to take with them, just to remind them that when the war was over and they could come home, hopefully, they could start trying to make a better world. And these uh, cross of nails was devised, um, just four nails so they won't stick in anybody, small enough to fit in any pocket. These the men took wherever they went. And so the Athona community came from what was called the Nails Movement in those days. After, after the war, my father was wanting to find a centre where people could meet um, with the purpose of reconciliation um, and peacemaking, of course. And one of the primary objects was trying to break down the barriers from the between the various Christian churches because at that time there was much more hostility between the Catholics and the Protestants and the free churches. Um, ecumenism had hardly started, and he felt only by meeting each other and talking together and living together could the barriers be broken down. So in 1940. Six, he was looking about and heard about this uh, chapel in the marshes. And they went one day out to investigate it. He had been to Glastonbury. He'd been to talk to George MacLeod on Iona um, and looked at various other places. But no, he didn't want to have to rebuild an abbey or uh, um, anywhere else. And then he saw the chapel. And he says, as he says in his book, I knew that we were home. On one of the local farms, there was a whole load of ex-army huts. Um, and the farmer said he could use some of these. So the first centre in 1946 was based um, in these huts. And at the end of the quite short season, um, all our stuff was left in the huts. My father went back to his parish and... A few months later, well into November, he had a phone call from one of the local policemen who said, did you know that the huts have been sold and all your stuff is sitting in the rain? Um, so he rushed down with a car and piled all our wet blankets and all the other stuff we'd left there back and took him back, took him back to his rectory. <laughs> but in 1946, um, seven, eight, they went back down to Bradwell because he so wanted to be near the chapel and begged a bit of land off the local farmer, which they had to drain and then get other ex army huts and tents and get that set up for the summer season. It was incredibly primitive. Water came from the chapel, which is about a quarter of a mile away, and had to be heaved in buckets and tanks. And so for many, many years, all our water uh, came from a cold tap near the chapel and we heaved it back. As we started each, um, each season, the first thing that had to happen was we had to dig a pit because there were l sand loos which had to be emptied every day and they were emptied into these vast pits taller than a man which had to be dug into the Essex clay. You can't imagine the work involved in that. There was a very anxious, nervous lady who used to come with her husband and children. And one night she heard her son calling from across the field where the toilets were. 
and as any mum would, I think it was after it was after dark, she rushed across to try and rescue her child, and she fell into one of the pits. You can imagine how horrendous this was. <laughs> and of course she was roughly pulled out and cleaned up. But we're told that it cured her neuroses. Um, I think after that nothing would would horrify you about hygiene anymore. <laughs> By the early 60s, we were getting such huge numbers, up to 100 people were coming at weekends, and Dad felt that it, it, when you get so many people, it's very much more difficult, especially if they're only there for a short time, to build community. So he started looking for another centre so that we could, um, you know, split the numbers a little bit and heard about this wonderful place at Burton Bradstock in West Dorset, um, which had belonged to, they were called the White Ladies. They were led by a remarkable mystic woman called Adela Curtis, who had started a community there. They must have been almost the first ecologists. They were almost entirely self-sufficient, including their white habits, um, made from the goats and sheep which they kept, hence the name the White Ladies. And she had built this house and a chapel um, on the hills overlooking Chesil Beach. Absolutely wonderful sight. So in 1965, um, a remarkable man called John Cross and his wife came down to open up um, the Burton Bradstock site. Now, they had it tough too because they had no running water, no gas, no electricity. All the water came through tanks in the roof which were filtered. Um, they cooked on with, uh, the, all the lighting was oil lamps which had to be lit every night. And when we first got there, the first um, time we saw it, it was like Sleeping Beauty's palace. The, brambles had grown up so high that you couldn't know there was a wonderful terrace outside and there were pictures of people hacking their way. One of those people was Douglas, the young Douglas Adams of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fame, hacking away at brambles. Um, and that took quite a, a long time. But John Cross, when they were in the early stages of redecorating and exploring, um, found that because they'd had the army there in, in the war, um, they found the odd gun left in the attic. And um, there was also a small, even a box of bombs discovered when the foundations were dug for, for, an ex, for the extension. That was a little bit later, obviously. But obviously quite, quite an adventure finding all this stuff left over from the military. We had ambassadors, we had barrow boys, we had a group called the Spivs who were wonderful workers and good at putting up huts and laying concrete. And everybody in the middle, housewives, doctors, factory workers, office workers, you name it, a very good mix. And my father got some remarkable speakers down because he had a wide range of contacts. Some of the earliest people to come were German prisoners of war who hadn't been repatriated. And in the very early days, he wrote to a group of German pastors inviting them over um, to join us. And to this day, we have a large contingent of, of Germans who come over. He also got in touch with an organisation called the Society of St Alban and St Sergius, and we used to get a group of white Russians, from largely from Paris, who would come over and their students bringing their balalaikas, which um, was utterly wonderful. I have an abiding love of balalaika music to this day. We At one point we used to get a lot of um, Polish students, and one young man said, wrote after he'd got home that he was grateful to the phoner because when he came, he hated all Germans because of what had happened to his grandparents in the war. But now he had met some Germans and stayed with them on his way home and had German friends. And this had changed his whole attitude. And I thought that was very exciting and really what a phone is supposed to be about. 
for me, it feels like a, a big extended family of lots of, you know, people who are, they're more like family than friends quite often. They're more like having lots of cousins and aunts and uncles in a way. I mean, it's all very open, of course, and, you know, can easily turn up there and not know a single soul and just get to know people. It's played such a huge part of my life. I know there were people who called it our phone and my father's mistress. So, <laughs> because it played such a large part in his life. Um, 75 years into the future. I would love to think that it will still be going on, really, with the same spirit. People talk about the spirit of the phone and, um, you know, like this year in lockdown, it's there's been so many changes and restrictions but people still have been saying yeah it's still got the spirit of a thona you still feel that you're there and it's it's still happening for me it would be very much as it is now in fact there may be as i i can't see further but i think the need for people to feel wanted and needed and valued is so important that if we do nothing more than that it's enough 